Let us now prepare our hearts as we continue our conversation on our new series entitled, Here Comes the King. We are now on the third part of our series, and let me entitle our conversation today, if you are taking notes, Creator Redeemer. Why do I combine these two very big titles of God, Creator Redeemer? Because in chapter 43 and 44 of Isaiah, as we dive into the text today, you will notice that God would use these titles to refer to Himself as He assured His own people, Israel, in their time of grief and suffering. God is saying to them, I am your Creator and also your Redeemer. It's a double ownership and we will understand later on what it means to have double ownership. And you have probably read these two beautiful chapters, 43 and 44. And as you dig deeper and continue to expound these two chapters, you will learn so many things. And actually, you can draw so many important lessons and principles from this beautiful poetry. But let us just concentrate on one very important truth that I would like to share with you this morning as we continue our series. And that truth is this. We reflect the image of the God we worship. We reflect the image of the God we worship. We reflect, we display, we demonstrate. It shows, we exhibit the image of the God that we trust, the God that we pray to, the God that we worship. So in this passage, this glaring truth will manifest and surface out as you listen to our conversation today. So I want to ask each and every one of you who are watching this video, I want you to pay attention very carefully and read every verse that I will be sharing with you because the flow of thought of the poetry is very, very crucial as God would build His argument and continue to assure His people and reveal to them very, very important truth as they make their choices to worship the Creator, their Redeemer, or turn their backs from Him and continue to worship those false idols that we have already learned last Sunday, as they continue to turn their backs from God and worship those false idols, eventually they will learn that they reflect the image and the glory of the God that they worship. So are we ready? Join me now as I read to you chapter 43 to 44. We left off last week with a sad note. Chapter 42 ended with a sad note that the very chosen servants of God were themselves blind and deaf. They were part of the problem instead of the solution. So there was a dilemma. There was this problem presented to us. God chose the ancient nation of Israel for them to become a covenant for the people of the world, to become the light of the world, to become His ambassador in bringing about the mission of God in saving and renewing this world. So we ended with that very, very, very sad that there was a dilemma what will God now do since the very chosen people that He has called uh, to fulfill His mission failed and forfeited that call? So what is God's plan? What will He do next? Now, chapter 43 begins with the very beautiful words, but now. Let us read verse 1. It says, but now, so in contrast, after saying the negative things, after the saying, we have problem, after revealing the problem, this is your situation, this is your predicament, and this is your problem, but now... So now God is turning into a very, very important juncture to inform the nation of Israel that although your situation is hopeless, although your situation is, uh, is bad because you're blind and deaf and you forfeited your call for the mission that I have called you to do, but now, so this is a juncture, but now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. Now, I want you to look at this verse very, very carefully because this is so loaded. God assuring His people, I know your predicament, I know your sin, I know your mistakes, I know your uh, hopeless situation. But here, God is saying, I want you to listen very carefully. I am the God who created you. Look at the word created. God is saying, I am your maker. I am your creator. I created you, O, o Israel, or Jacob. I formed you. So this reminds us of the very words he said 
to Jeremiah when Jeremiah was doubting his call and he was doubting whether he was indeed called by God because the very people that he was ministering to were not listening to him. They were so stubborn. And God assured Jeremiah that before I, before I form you in your mother's womb, I knew you, Jeremiah. The same language, I form you, O Israel. And then here comes the encouragement of God. Fear not. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. Look at the word redeem. It's past tense. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. So in other words, what God is saying, I have redeemed you. I have purchased you. I have bought you back. And later on, Isaiah would reveal this. How did God do this? In what way? What was the process? Who did it? So later on, as we, as we progress in our conversation, we will discover how God redeemed the nation of Israel, and also the entire world. Look at verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. What a comforting assurance of God's presence. I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Why? Why such an assurance? Then God continues saying, Because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Your Savior. Interesting. I will be your Savior. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cas and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Now before we continue, I want you to feel the emotion in verse 4. Since you are precious to me, you are valuable to me, I called you, you are mine, you are honored in my sight. And look at the endearing statement of God, the Creator, the Maker, Redeemer of Israel, because I love you. What a beautiful assurance. Maybe we are also doubting about our value, our identity today as followers of Christ. Remember how God would assure His people, the ancient nation of Israel who were in rebellion, who were in exile in Babylon, and yet God, even though His very own people turned their backs from Him, look at how God would would court His people back and assure His people back and comfort them with this message, I am with you, I am your God, I love you, you are precious and honored in my sight. And then again He said, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. As if God is already telling them not only then, but even today in the, in the future when you are scattered, I'll bring you back. Whether you are from the east or from the west, I will bring you back and I will gather your children. The imagery here is of the mother hen gathering his little chicks and under his wings for his protection as the care of a mom. God continues saying, I will... St- I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Even though you are scattered all over the world today or even in the future, God is already assuring His people, I will gather you again. You are my sons and my daughters. Look at the very heart of God here, relating to His people, His rebellious people. God would never forsake or abandon His people. And Isaiah continued writing, Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. Obviously referring to Israel, they were spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, as we have learned in the last session. All the nations gathered together and the people assembled Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right so that others may hear and say, It is true. Again, God is returning here to the challenge with the idols. Did your idols, the gods of Babylon, proclaim all these things? Do they proclaim good messages and good tidings about what will happen in the future? We have learned last Sunday that they could not even speak. None of them, no one of them had ever proclaimed what is about to happen because they don't know what what happened in the past, what's happening now, and even what's going to happen in the future. 
Those are the gods, the idols, who are lifeless, false, and useless. And God here, as if in a trial, call your witnesses. Let them bring their witnesses to prove they were right. These idols, do they have witnesses to prove and validate their authenticity and their, and their existence? And the following verses, God now is saying, if the idols have no witnesses to call, if the idols have no witnesses to bring in because there is actually none, look at what God is saying in verses 10 to 11. You are my witnesses, O Israel. You referring to the ancient nation of Israel. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. Now, look at verses 10 to 11. Look at the exclusivity here. There is no other God apart from me, before me, or even after me. And because there is no a God before me or after me, there is no Savior apart from me. So what God is actually trying to say to the nation of Israel, to the ancient nation of Israel who were in exile in Babylon, and for all of us who are listening today, there is no other God than the God, the creator of heaven and the earth, who revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And because there is no other God apart from him, he is therefore the only savior of the world. Meaning, Israel, stop trusting those idols because they could not save you. I am the only God who can save you from your predicament. What a powerful message and a reminder, not only for the ancient people, but even for us today, whatever our situations and circumstances. God continues speaking, I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I, not some foreign God among you, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Here we can see that Jesus used the same word as he resurrected from the grave and commissioned his people, the early church, you are my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Being a witness means we are the evidence. We are the living evidences of God's power and love and grace. Meaning we are the very people who experience the reality of God. Therefore, we are His witnesses. We can validate that God really exists. So in the same manner, God is saying to His people, Israel, you have witnessed how I divided the Red Sea, how I provided manna from heaven, how I provided for you, protected you. You have seen my glory, the pillar of fire by night and the, the pillar of clouds by day. You have seen the manifestation of my presence and you are therefore my witnesses. Now, I want you to picture this with me. If we are all sitting in a courtroom, observing an ongoing trial and God saying, my witnesses are the very nation of Israel because they themselves experience my power, my mighty and valiant right hand. And they are the one who have seen how I have delivered them, their forefathers, even up to this very moment. So in the same way, if God would ask for witnesses today, if God is indeed true and He exists, we expect all of us Christians and followers of Christ to stand on the witness stand and say, and give our testimony that indeed we have experienced God, His power, His love, His saving grace, and that God is indeed alive and is true because we are His witnesses. We are His living proofs, evidences in this world. Now the following verses, 14 to 17, God continued to assert and assure His very people who are listening to the prophecy of Isaiah that He is the sole creator, redeemer, and king, implying that He's the only one capable of delivering them from their bondage in, in Babylon, from their exile, and bring them back to Jerusalem and fulfill all those promises that He has uttered to assure them because He has the power to back it up because He is the sovereign Lord and creator of all things. That's why the following verses, He recalled again to the remembrance, the Exodus. Now, before we continue, let us remember when these prophecies of Isaiah uh, were being read to the ancient nation of Israel who were in Babylon. They have already served for more than 50 years or nearing about the 70 
uh, years of their Babylonian exile and they were already at the end where God was about to bring them back to Jerusalem. So when God was recalling the events in Exodus, this new generation who were hearing and reading, probably they heard all those stories from their fathers and their parents who were already gone and have died in Babylon or died in Jerusalem. So this generation have actually no clue or have no experience of, of such kind of deliverance because most of them who were reading this were the new generation who were born in Babylon or who were, who were youngsters when they were brought to Babylon and they were already in their prime years during this time. So they only heard about the Exodus event and God is saying here, I will again give you a new Exodus. I will do it again, but I will do it in a new way. It's a new deliverance just as I have delivered your forefather from Egypt. I, the same God of your forefather, will deliver you from your exile in Babylon. God reminded them that your forefathers were so scared when the Egyptian chariots and horses were following them behind and they were caught uh, in between the mountains, the deserts on the right, but in front of them was the Red Sea. And probably their forefathers during that time thought that they will die in the wilderness and suffer in that part of the desert because there's no way to escape from the angry Egyptian who were pursuing them from behind. But lo and behold, we all know the story in Exodus. God divided the Red Sea before the very eyes of their forefathers. And here, God is assuring the new generation who were about to be brought back from Babylon to Jerusalem by the same God, the same powerful Creator God, God again would assure them of the new Exodus. But very interestingly, as God would recall and remind them of what happened to their forefathers as to how God delivered them. It's very interesting here because the next verse, God is telling them, forget about all those things. Look at the, look at the next verse. God said, after telling all those beautiful stories, He said this, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I really find this funny after recalling those beautiful things and God is saying, now forget all those things because I am about to do something new. What God is actually saying here is He is unpredictable. If the water was an obstacle before them, He divided the waters. Now, if it's the desert, He will divide the desert. God, in other words, is unpredictable. He does not repeat what he has done in the past, he do it in a better and new way. So this is exactly the essence of this verse. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on it. Do not stereotype God. Do not put him in a box because God indeed works in mysterious ways and always in new ways. So meaning to say for all of us today, let us always expect God to do something new for all of us today. Come to think of it, it's really true. There was only one Moses, one Abraham, one Jacob, one David. God is free and sovereign to do new things to new individuals in a new way. So for all of us who are followers of Christ today, we have read and we know and we have experienced and we will continue to know and experience in the future the new things that God is doing through His people. Aren't you excited? We have a wonderful and a beautiful God who is unpredictable. He is the God full of surprises. No wonder His mercies are new every morning. In other words, God would not give us His leftover grace and mercy. They are always new in the morning. He gives us His fresh love, fresh mercy, fresh dealings, and fresh power in His presence. And we are witnessing the new things, the new creation that God is doing, that God is actually doing in this world. What are those new things that God is doing? Let's just pause for a while. Let's just come to the present. As we continue to relate to one another in our koinonia, as we meet our friends, as we share the gospel to our friends and our families and our relatives, you see, when they receive the gospel and when they go through, this, and when they go through the spiritual transformation, we are actually seeing and witnessing the new creation, the new things that God is doing, how He changed people's lives, how He changed you and me, and He continued to change us from glory to glory. 
we look back 20, 30, 40 years ago, we are totally a different person. And it's only by the grace and the mercy of God that we are continually changing and transforming into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. We are witnesses. We are part of that new creation. Now look at the next verse as God would continue to elaborate that the new creation that He, that he has promised to His people, that when that thing happened, it is not only humanity that will experience that new creation, but look at the next verse. The wild animals honor me, the jackals, the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I form for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. So here, not only mankind is being redeemed, but the entire world, the new creation, because that creation that God made, was broken, it needed redemption and salvation as well. Apostle Paul explained that in Romans chapter 8. Nature and the entire universe is also groaning and waiting for its redemption. So God is in the business of saving and renewing this world, saving humanity and renewing this world back to its former glory. And then look at verse 22. Look at the heart of God here. He said, Yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. What happened here? That in spite of all those revelations, interventions, and the promises of God, yet Israel have not called upon the name of the Lord. Why? Why still being stubborn at this very moment? Why would they not reach out to God and, and turn to God now that God is calling them back? God continued saying, You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. In other words, what God is saying, you have stopped worshiping me. You have stopped honoring me. You have stopped sacrificing for me. The reality here is, maybe some of them continue to do those sacrifices as revealed in chapter 1 of Isaiah, but their hearts were no longer with it. It has only become a ritual for them, people who were left in Jerusalem. But for most of them, God is, God is saying, this is, your, this is your status. You have stopped worshiping me with your heart. You have not brought any fragrant calamus for me or the aromatic smell or, or lavish me the fat of your sacrifices. Look at the contrast. But you have burdened me instead with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. What happened to the ancient nation of Israel? It looks like their hearts became harder and harder. Instead of turning to God in repentance, they have stopped honoring God. God continues saying, I, even I am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. But in spite of all that the Israelites were doing, God is saying to His people, I am the one who blots out your transgression for my own sake and remember your sins no more. This verse is actually very a heartwarming, that God is forgiving His people who are not asking for forgiveness. They have not brought Him any sacrifice. They have not honored Him. And yet He is the one who blots out their transgressions and promised that He would not remember their sins. It speaks of God's grace and mercy, forgiving the very people who does not deserve forgiveness like us today. That's mercy. God continues saying, Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case of your innocence. This recalls chapter 1 of Isaiah. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins is as red as scarlet, it shall be white as snow. Remember that in chapter 1? You see, God is a very reasonable God. Bring your argument. Let us settle this. State your case. State your case for your innocence. God is giving His people the chance. Speak up. Speak out. What a beautiful invitation that God is a listening God, that God is a reasonable God, that God is willing to listen and hear what we want to say. He is not an authoritarian God that does not listen to the plight of His people. We have a gracious and merciful God being demonstrated here. In connection with that invitation, He reminded His people, Your first father sinned. Those I sent to teach you rebelled against me. So I disgraced the dignitaries of your temple. I consigned Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. Many Bible scholars would think of Adam here. Your first father sin. Or maybe Jacob. 
None of them are perfect. Abraham, who lied. Jacob, who cheated. Isaac, and so on and so forth. God is saying, I have, I have dealt with your forefathers with the same grace and mercy as I am dealing with you today. Your prophets, your teachers, those who are serving in the temple, all of them. That is the reason why you find yourselves in a foreign land in exile in Babylon. You're not there because the emperor of Babylon is more powerful than the God of Israel. You were there because of the sin of your fathers. Now remember, most of the readers of these prophecies of Isaiah were probably born in, in Babylon, a new generation of Israel, a remnant for God to return to Jerusalem. God is recalling to them their, their roots. You were there, your forefathers came to Babylon in exile because of their disobedience and sin and rebellion against God. God goes back to how he started chapter 43. Look at verse 1 of chapter 44. But now, again, the shift, the turn of events, meaning, yes, that's your predicament, that's your situation, but I want you to pay attention carefully here. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says who made you who formed you in the womb, who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. This is the same admonition and and statements he gave in verse 1 of chapter 43. I created you. I formed you. I am your helper. I will be your deliverer. And assuring his people repeatedly, do not be afraid. Be afraid of what? Do not be afraid to put your trust in me. Although you do not see me, compared to the gods of the Babylonians that you can see, God is saying, I am real. I am true. I was the one who formed you. I was the one who made you. And I will be the one to help you. How will he do this? For I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. God, again speaking here, the image of a new creation. I will renew. I will pour out my spirit on your children and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. In other words, God, there will be prosperity. You will again populate the land. You will be blessed by the God who created you and form you. God continued describing that picture, that future, that new creation that God has promised His people. On that day, one will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will take the name of Israel. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. What a declaration, a powerful and a clear declaration of God. There is no other God before me or even after me because I am the first and I am the last. And this God who is speaking this is telling the very afraid and fearful people of Israel who were in Babylon, do not be afraid. Trust in me. I am your creator and I have redeemed you. Then he said, Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let him foretell what will come. Again, going back to the challenge with the idols and at the same time comforting his people. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Again, God is returning. You are my... You are the very people who experience my existence. You are the very people who are the beneficiary of my revelation. You, therefore, are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? And the answer is clear. No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Meaning to say, there is no other solid foundation. There is no other uh, rock where you can build your lives and secure yourself. Only to God, your Creator and Redeemer, where you can find security and stability. And he continued, All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. 
those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. Now here God is uh, highlighting the idol makers. Who shapes a God and cast an idol which can profit him nothing? Who does that? Who does that futility and useless things? He and his kind will be put to shame. Those idol makers will be put to shame. Craftsmen are nothing but men. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and infamy. God is saying, Israel, come, listen carefully. Those makers of those idols, those craftsmen, are mere human beings. They're nothing but men like you and me. How can a mere creation create a God? You see? You see that foolishness there? And then God challenged them, let them, come, let them all come together and take their stand. Call them. Maybe they are, they are uh, priding themselves on their vocation and their, in their profession and they're being an idol maker that they're claiming, to, they're claiming to be the one, the maker of their gods. Let them come together and take their stand. But I tell you what God is actually saying here. They will be brought down to terror and infamy. Why? Because we know that idols are all false. They're lifeless. They're actually nothing. There's no power in them. What a very sharp and powerful declaration of God here. And then verses 12 to 20 comes the most detailed and the most sovereign uh, record in the scripture that talks about the uselessness and the futility and the nonsenseness, if there's such a word, of idol makers and idol worshippers. It tells us of what happened, how the craftsmen and the and the carpenter would would use their giftedness, would draw the line, would make idols out of metal or out of wood. They would carve them and they would make an image and make a shrine and for people to worship those idols. Some Bible scholars would call this paragraph as the satire of idol worship because it's, it reveals the, the foolishness and the gullibility of people who are worshippers of idols. He started by describing how the craftsman would get a metal and shape it into an idol or a carpenter would take a wood, use his tools, draw a line and figure and, uh, and carve it and, uh, and make an idol out of that wood. And as they grow tired and grow hungry, they would use parts of those woods where they carved the gods and the image and the idols that they, that, that they made. And when they are hungry and when they are cold, they would, use, they would use the other parts of the woods to make fire, to warm themselves, or even use them to fuel and make their, make their meal so that they would, uh, they would be satisfied and be filled. And God is saying to the nation of Israel, you see, Half, half of the wood they form and people worship and the other half of the wood they use, for, uh, to, they use for fire and to cook meal so that they will be filled and they will be warm. While the other part would be put in a shrine and people will bow down and worship and pray to it. God is revealing here the insanity of idol maker and idol worshippers. Now I want you to pay attention to the following verses as God would continue to build on this satire uh, of idol worship and idol making. He said, From the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. So the other half of those woods, he would use for fire to warm him at night or even to use as a fuel to cook him food because he was hungry and tired of making those idols. And then God said, Look at this. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see and their minds closed so they cannot understand. He was describing, God is describing here the idols. Look at their eyes. They're not real. They're just plastered on it. That's why they could not see and they could not perceive. Look at their heads. They don't have minds. Their minds are closed. So in the same way, the worshippers reflect the image of the God they worship. You see here, we become the God that we worship. We reflect the image of the God that we worship, the God we pray to. They have eyes, but they could not see. They have mind, but they could not understand. It's really sad because idolatry 
is not only something that happened in the past, even in our time today, in our world today, people still find themselves worshipping idols who were made out of wood, ceramics, or metal. How can a creation make a god and worship? The imagery here is that these carpenters would go out into the field, in the forest, and they would look and choose for a tree, a good tree, and they would say, this tree is nice, I will protect it, I will nurture it, let the rain nurture, let the, let the sun nurture it, and, and out of the tree, they will cut it into half, the other half they will form into a god, and the other half they will use for other things, for fuel, or for any other things. While forgetting who created the tree, who created the rain, who sends the rain, who created the sunshine. You see how they miss the creator of the heavens and the earth? They use the tree and forget about the one who created the tree. That's what Isaiah was trying to say here. And the worst thing is this, look at verse 19. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I use for fuel. I even bake bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Now, I want you to look at this verse again. And let's just allow this verse to linger for a while. No one stops to think. Meaning, is there still anyone thinking what we're doing is the right thing? Look at the spiritual blindness in people's lives. We can be so intelligent and so blind. We can be so knowledgeable and also spiritually deaf. What God is actually saying here is, it's so obvious. The nonsenseness of all these things is so obvious, and yet because of sin, people could not perceive and could not understand. No one has the discernment to see what is right and wrong. Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Shall I depend my life and my future to a piece of metal? God continues saying, Such a person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? Oh, what a sad truth here. What a sad reality here. People who worship idols and turn their backs from God and worship other gods are actually misled by their deluded heart. And look at the hopeless situation here. He cannot save himself because he has no ability and capability to save himself. Only God, the Creator, Redeemer, and the Savior of the world can extend his hand and lift us up from the miry clay of sin. Because on our own, we human beings, on our own, we cannot see what is obvious. We need God's mercy and grace for our eyes to be open and our hearts to be warm so that we can see and understand. Look at the last line. Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? That's a point wherein you already have a poison in your hand and you don't even know and you're still about to take that poison. It's already a lie. It's not this thing in my right hand. It's already a lie and we cannot tell or distinguish what is right and wrong. And as God would conclude chapter 44, He returns back in calling His people, in reaching out to His ancient nation of Israel, who were rebellious, who, were, who forsook the, right, the righteous path, and follow their own sinful ways. God is saying in verse 21, Remember these things, O Jacob, for you are my servant. This is who you are. This is your calling. This is your vocation. I have made you. You are my servant, O Israel. I will not forget you. I feel God here. We can only say that His love and mercy endures forever. What a stubborn love that never let go of you and me. He continued assuring his people, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. 
Return to me, for I have redeemed you. What God is actually saying here, Remember this, O Jacob. Remember this, O Israel. Even if you are stubborn and continually turning your backs from me, I will not let you go. Come to me. Return to me, God is saying, for I have redeemed you. Don't worry about your sin. I have already forgiven you. I have washed away your sins. I have blocked out your sins. I have already swept away your offenses like a cloud. Your sins, like a morning mist, it's already gone. And I will not remember them. Just return to me, my people. I can feel God here as a loving mother, as a loving parent, like the father, the gracious father of the prodigal son. No matter what you have done, just return home. Just come home. God is saying, with open arms, I will welcome you back and renew your status as my son and my children. And then verse 23, he encouraged the people to worship and celebrate. There is a party waiting. When you come back, when you return, just like the prodigal son, sing for joy, O heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, O earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests. And all your trees, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays His glory in Israel. God is encouraging His people. Let us celebrate. The redemption is already done. Later on, they will, He will reveal it. Okay. God is saying, the redemption has already been done. It is a done deal. Victory is assured. Let us rejoice. Let us shout to God in celebrations. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, again, stressing the title, I am your Creator, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens and who spread out the earth by myself, who foils the sign of the false prophets and make fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the prediction of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, It shall be inhabited of the towns of Judah, they shall be built, and of their ruins I will restore them. God is inviting his people, let us now rejoice and celebrate, because what I have promised to you, the new exodus and the new creation that is awaiting you, is already done, waiting for you. What an assured victory. And then I want you to look at verses 27, 28 as God would conclude chapter 44 of this beautiful poetry. He said, Who says to the watery deep, Be dry, and I will dry up your streams? Who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, I will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, Let it be revealed, and of the temple, Let its foundation be laid. Now let's pause for a while and look at this verse. God named a person, Cyrus. As we all know, Cyrus the Great is the king of Medo-Persia who would later invade and succeed Babylon, the great Babylon. So here, God was very specific. Many Bible scholars would say that, that Cyrus at this time was not even born yet. And God, again, demonstrating being the God of history, the sovereign Lord who is behind history is predicting and declaring that I will raise a man and his name will be Cyrus who doesn't even know him yet at this moment who will be my shepherd who will do what I please he will be an instrument for me just like you, O Israel as my chosen servant I have other chosen servants who will do my will and accomplish my purpose in this world he will be the one to succeed and overthrow the great Babylon Empire. We all know that in history. And he will be my agent who will declare to Jerusalem, let it be revealed from the ruins of Jerusalem. And the temple, he would say, let its foundation be laid. Scholars call this predictive prophecy. God was to the dot in his prophetic statement, he is the God who can foretell what's happening in the future. He is the God who can foretell what is about to happen. 
He's not only the God who, who acted in the past and in the present, but He is the same God who is acting in our behalf for our future. So as we conclude this series, what's the bottom line? Again, we reflect the image of the God that we worship. It's very clear here that if we worship the God who is our Creator and Redeemer, we become His witnesses, we experience His grace and His mercy, His intervention, His power, His wisdom, His love, and other things. And we demonstrate and reflect the image of the God that we worship. But if we turn our backs from our Creator Redeemer and worship idols, lifeless, false idols, false gods, we display and reflect the image of the God that we worship. As revealed by Isaiah here, that Israel reflected the very image of the God that we worship. They were blind, they were deaf, they were hopeless, they could do nothing. They could not even discern what is right and wrong. In other words, when we continue to worship other gods instead of the true and living God, our Creator and Redeemer, we become less human. That's the consequence of idolatry. We become less human. So in other words, as we submit to God for His redemption and we regain back the image of God because in Genesis chapter 1, He created man as He created man after his own image and his likeness. And the image of God is reflecting through humanity. The image that God has created in us. And we have seen that in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That the true humanity is made possible and displayed and reflected in the life of Christ. That's the very image of God in us. So my brothers and sisters, we become like the God that we worship. Maybe we're saying, how is this now applicable and relevant to our situations today? Well, we all know that idolatry is still here, present in our time. Maybe it takes a different form. The sad truth is this. We may be in the 21st century, but still, idolatry is very true and a reality today. It is no longer limited on a, physical, on a physical image of metal or wood or ceramics. But idolatry is anything other than God. If we listen to other voice other than the, the voice of the true and living God, which He reveals Himself in the Scripture and through His Holy Spirit, then that's idolatry. Where do we put our trust and our hope for this life? If it is not on God? That it's another God. Maybe we're trusting ourselves. Maybe our hope is on the economy, on our bank accounts, or on our friends, on our, or, or our department, or our company. Then those things become our God. It replaces God in our lives. Anything that replaces the Creator or Redeemer in our lives becomes a God to us. So let us be careful, brothers and sisters. Even for us Christians and followers of Christ, we may, be, we may be claiming that we are followers of Christ, but if we are not giving our 100% confidence and trust and loyalty to God alone, if we are still relying on other things and putting, and, and putting our trust and confidence on other things that can be our idols today, let us always remember. That's the first sin of man. When Adam listened to other voice other than his creator, that was idolatry. He listened to the voice of the serpent. He even trusted more on the words of the serpent. You shall not, you shall not die. You see the consequence when we listen to other voice other than listening to the voice of God? Exile. Ever since, from Genesis down through history, the dividing line is those who are listening to other voice and those who are listening to the voice of God. No wonder Jesus said, if you are my sheep, you would know and listen to my voice. Jesus demonstrated being a true human that he would always listen to the voice of his Father, follow the voice of his Father. 
There were temptations in Jesus' life. We all know that, recorded in the New Testament, how the voice of Satan would linger and would tempt Jesus, tempting him to use his power to be independent and not rely on his Father. But Jesus showed us what loyalty and trust to God is all about. He only listened to the voice of his Father. Kumusta tayo mga kapatid? How are you, my brothers and sisters? God is our creator and redeemer. It speaks of double ownership. He did not only create us, He owned us, but somehow we were led away. We were led astray. We lost our path. We lost our way. But God found us and bought us again and redeemed us. Now He owned us back. Double ownership. That's what it means when God said, I am your creator and I am your redeemer. Now that's what it means when God said, I am your creator and your redeemer. I form you. I made you in your mother's womb. I will help you. And I called you by name. So what do we do now? How do we apply this? Here's my challenge for each and every one of us listening and watching this video. Return to your Creator. Let us all return to our Creator and our Maker and our Redeemer. Just like God, just as God, Yahweh, invited the ancient nation of Israel, whose hearts are away and far from Him, He said, return to me, my people. That's the only way we can regain the image of God when we return back to our Maker and Redeemer. Remember, We reflect the image of the God that we worship. So before I close in prayer and pray for each and every one of us, let us again meditate and reflect through this beautiful song and allow God to speak to us as we listen, as we listen to this beautiful song.
us bow our heads as we conclude in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, our Creator and our Redeemer, today we would like to thank you, O God, for reminding us as well as we listen and study the beautiful poetry of, of Isaiah chapter 43 and 44. Father, thank you so much that you have reminded us that you have created us and formed us in our mother's womb, that you know us by name because you are our maker and we belong to you, O God. Father, may this beautiful truth that we have learned today remind us all the time to always find ourselves going back to you. Teach us, Lord, that we may only listen to your voice through your word and through your spirit that we may follow and obey you, O Lord. Lord, may you guard our hearts that we may not turn our backs from you and worship and trust other gods because only you, O Lord, who knows us because you created us and you form us. Only in you, we can find hope and salvation. Father, thank you, and I commit to you each and everyone who are listening and have participated in this online gathering. Bless every family represented, Lord, and keep us safe and healthy until we see each other again next week, O God. Thank you, and may you be honored and be praised in our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. See you next week.